face through this Lenten season. On our journey, you have heard the story of Abraham and how mercy withheld the knife from the Isaac and grace provided a ram for sacrifice. Last week, Leslie taught about the prodigal father. We worship a prodigal God that wants to run out and forgive us and throw a lavish celebration when we decide to come home. If you've missed any of these and want to review, or even just want to review them, you can certainly go online at sulfurchurch.org and review the sermon series that we're doing. This week, we are hanging out with Christ and his thieves. Well, maybe that was a little too much, wasn't it? As we live through their story, a story of last breath salvation, a story of mercy as God hears the cry of repentance on the cross, a story of grace upon grace as the thief is promised paradise and is hand delivered by Christ himself. We know that as we approach Easter, as we journey down this road of mercy and grace, we see three men. These men have been condemned to death. And it's not an easy death at that. To be crucified, you literally are hung on the cross, fastened to the wood with large nails. It is an agonizing and painful death. It's also a death that usually takes days to occur. The whole purpose was to display the hanging body as a warning to others that this may occur to you if you are not careful. Three crosses, three men, three very different responses. One, the thief died in sin and was lost. On the other cross, the thief died to sin and was saved. On the third cross, a lamb died for sin and was the son of God. We know that the two men that committed crimes that condemned them to the cross, we also know that the other man, Jesus, was wrongfully condemned to the cross by the religious leaders of that time. All three hanging out, preparing to die. The first breath of mercy we see today is a pardon. Is a pardon. Not for the thieves, but rather for the perpetrators. And ultimately, for each one of us. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. As the three are hanging out, the crowd chimes in and starts heckling, starts throwing verbal salt into the wounds of Christ. Even the criminals, both of them, are chiming in, mocking Christ. One of them piping up and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and me. Always good to throw yourself in there, right? But this was a turnaround moment. That was when a moment when mercy and grace arose from the pain and agony that they were all experiencing from that horrid death. We don't know why the thief had a change of heart, but we're glad that he did. He corrected the other thief, scolded him for his unkind words. Do you not fear God since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? This man has done nothing wrong. Nothing. Following is that moment. The thief turns to Jesus and he realizes he gets something. Something is different. And he realizes that there's, there's more to this tattered man who's hanging there with him. Verse 42, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What does he say? You're there. 
today you will be with me in paradise. Mercy and grace merge in this heaven meets earth moment. Jesus is looking at the thief and looking forward to the eternal place in heaven with him. That is mercy. That is grace. That is love. I recall a mercy, grace moment in my life. I was 15 years old. Now, 15-year-olds in Texas are learning to do what? Drive. They're learning to drive, that's right. But I was still young and dumb at that time. And I was armed with my learner's permit. Because I could do everything with a learner's permit. I now understand why they discourage kids from driving. It's because, as Bill Cosby puts it, kids are brain dead. Kids, like me at the time, don't think rationally. Because I thought it'd be a good idea to practice driving. That sounds rational. By myself. At 5 o'clock in the morning. When the rest of the world was asleep. This used to be my dad's car, a Datsun F10. Yes, for you younger folks, that means Nissan. I was still inexperienced at how to drive, and I judged poorly a sharp turn in the road. I ended up hitting a light pole, flipping the car upon a neighbor's thing, and basically leaving the car and the light pole in shatters. In that moment of foolishness, I really let myself down and those that I loved. What surprised me was my response from my family. I decided on my own that I would not drive for a while. I thought that was my own self-punishment because I was really disappointed with my, my own behavior. What was amazing and totally unexpected was that my parents did not punish me. Or they didn't punish me in any sense that I remember. I think I asked them about it, about punishment or consequences, and they just told me that they were thankful that I was alive. That I was alive. Wow. Wow. Mercy withholds what we deserve. I deserve so much punishment. I deserve to be punished. To repay for the car. To repay for the increase in their insurance. To repay for the light post. To repay for the hurt that I caused. I deserve so much for the hurt that I caused. But mercy was given instead of wrath. In addition to the... Carnage, go ahead and go back to my car. You were kind of an ugly little car, weren't you? <laughs> I have a, a little side joke, whatever. My dad, uh, the thing that started getting sea rust, whatever. When you're down in Corpus, you get sea salt rust on it, and it started getting what he called cancer all over the thing. And he jokingly said that the car actually committed suicide and just found <laughs> the first teenage person to assist him in the process. In addition to the carnage that was left behind, the totaled car, the annihilated light post, were three tickets. Three tickets that were issued on my little journey. These were not those sign on the dotted line and pay the fine tickets. These were show up in court because you're in trouble, Mr. Tickets. Three tickets, one for no insurance, one for no license, and one for failure to maintain. I went to the judge and I told him how sorry he was about the whole situation that I felt like I should not drive for a while. And I told him that this was my own punishment, not my parents, my own. The judge heard my plea and he said something to us lawyerly like, I'm not sure exactly what he said, and then the bailiff escorted us to another room 
I think it was like a clerk of court's office, you know, the big glass uh, place with a little window and all that. And the clerk asked for our papers. And Mom and I looked at each other kind of blankly and said, she, well, the judge didn't give us any papers. What do you mean? What do you mean he didn't give you any papers? And she just shot up and left. What's the deal? And she came back. I said, you can go. Well, I, I don't get it. I said, how much do we owe for this? Nothing. Nothing. The judge dismissed all of it. What do you mean, all of them? The clerk commented, you need to understand that this judge is usually extremely hard on teenagers like you. I don't know what you said. I don't know what you did. But you're free to go. And you should be thankful for the grace you just received. <laughs> Indeed, I was. See, that was potentially owing around $1,000 with the fines that was right there. Back in those days. I was given grace. Something I certainly did not deserve. I did not deserve the mercy my parents gave me or the grace that judge provided. Yet both were given in abundance. Our thief on the cross did not deserve either mercy or grace. Yet we worship a God, a Father, a judge that gave him both. He heard the cry of the thief on the cross and promised him paradise that very day. Jesus is at his, the last hours of his life. He's been unlawfully charged on crimes he did not commit, beaten for things that he did not do, and left to die for, for, with criminals, and is later for our own sins, withholding the eternal punishment that we all deserve and promising us an eternal life that we do not deserve. I did not deserve mercy or grace way back when I was 15. But I was given both. I was given both. Pardon fully for what I did. Mostly because I was already repentant for my deed and determining others that I would not be driving for a while. Unfortunately, that self-inflicted punishment did not last a couple of months or even a year. It lasted three years. Why? There was nothing that was hanging over me to not drive, except for me hanging on my own cross of condemnation. For some reason, I felt that my punishment was not long enough. My parents had already given me the green light. I had a license. I had insurance. I had their permission. But I wouldn't drive. Three years. Criminals don't get that. There was nothing holding me back except for myself. I think all too often, we are our own worst critics. That in the cheering squad of the devil and the demons. You are no good. You were already in a wreck. Remember what you caused? Look how much you cost them. And on and on and on. Hanging onto my own cross of condemnation. I realize now that I, I could have let go. Because I've already received the mercy. I already received the grace that was given by my parents and that judge. On our other story, the other thief could have received that same salvation, that same promise of paradise as the other thief did. He could have received the same thing. Yet in his own mind, he was responsible for holding back, holding back from him, paradise. His own decision to hang on to his own misery was the reason that he now hangs on to it forever. 
So, what are you hanging on to? What are you hanging on? What keeps you hanging up in your walk with Christ? Are there issues in your life that you are struggling with right now that you are still hanging on to? Do you have a, a past relationship or an addiction or a habit that keeps hanging on your cross? Do you have a hurt that is never healed because you keep picking at it like an old scab and keep reopening the wound again and again and again? What keeps you hanging on your cross? Christ calls each of us to carry our cross, to carry it, not to hang from it. That was a one and done deal. He did it for us. We don't have to do it for him or anybody else for that matter. Carry your cross, yes. Hang from it, no. Stop condemning yourself. Get off your cross and let whatever is condemning you go. Let it go. God's mercy and grace were big enough for Abraham. God's mercy and grace were big enough for the prodigal son. God's mercy and grace were big enough for the thug hanging next to him on the cross. His mercy and grace were big enough to save the world, release me from my own self-inflicted prison, and it's big enough for any problem that you have. Any problem that you have. Let your problems go. Quit hanging on to the old baggage that leaves you hanging on to a cross that has already been hung by Christ himself. His blood, his body has redeemed us all to live to our fullest potential now and, and also live eternally with him in paradise. Holding on to your sin, holding on to what your hurts is, is what the devil wants you to do. Feel sorry for yourself. Feel that you're worthless, not worthy of his love and his grace. So, are you going to be like the first thief that holds on to his sin, holds on to his past, holds on and hangs on his cross and dies to himself? Or are you going to be like that repentant thief who acknowledges that his problem may be bigger than him, but nothing is bigger than our God? Nothing. Are you going to quit hanging on the cross of condemnation and start carrying your cross by telling others of the good news of Jesus Christ? Christ bore our pain, hung for our shame, took all the blame, quit playing the game, and call the name above all names. And that name is who? Jesus Christ. Mercy and grace. It's what it's all about. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.